Try it again. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Unhindered by Coding live stream. This is Nick McPhee, and we will be here programming for, well, hello, Izitsu. Wonderful to see you again um, for the next two hours. Uh, <clears throat> this would normally be um, work. So Tuesday morning is normally work on the Ice Repos web app. I'm completely stuck on that at the moment, um, as I mentioned over on Discourse uh, last night. I have spent many hours, um, yeah, 50 episodes. So this is, the end of the day, we'll have 100 hours of this nonsense. Hard to imagine. Um, probably a little over 100 because most of the episodes run a little long. Um, uh, the... The OAuth stuff on the web app is just, I'm completely befuddled. I have spent days reading and poking and I'm really lost on how to make progress on that. And having spent basically the last two Ice Repos episodes flailing uh, and not really getting anywhere, I just don't think that's the best use of everybody's time. I still think I need to understand some things to move forward on that. And I'm working on trying to understand those things. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> I'm, so the, the problem is, okay, let me, uh, where's my note on discord that would help remind me of where I was. Um, so the problem really is that right now we I was trying to use actually I can even find a picture right uh, oops back up go away um, let's we'll come back to you in a second um, wanna 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 can I get to this? easily drive um wah, wah, wah. come on so i made some pictures because i was trying to just clarify for myself okay here we go <clears throat> this is what <clears throat> i was thinking of as the way or a way of doing it um and i can't um I cannot seem to make this thing work. And there are, actually, I found a pretty good out of the box tool. There's a thing called U OAuth2, which we poked at, at the on the last stream Saturday. But I can't even, I can't get that to work. Um, and I'm not sure whether it's me. Well, I'm not sure whether it's an architecture problem or a programming problem or a OAuth. You hate GitHub problem. I'm I'm completely befuddled. So, um, so I think kind of here is where we were, or what I was thinking about. Um, and so the idea was that the browser would send the login request. Cloudflare would have the interaction with GitHub to do the handshake and token exchange and then send the token back to the browser. The browser would then be able to like pass the token back and forth to GitHub uh, and conversations would ensue. Now, even if I could make that work, which I cannot, and we can talk about why I think that's not happening. I'm not even sure that's what you're supposed to do. So it's not super clear, like the readings on OAuth are really confusing. I have I have read a lot of the internet on OAuth, and I don't feel any smarter at the other end, um, which is yiggy. Um, actually, if anybody knows of a book, I'm going to be old here and be like, I could really use a good book on OAuth. And I only just had that thought, so I have not looked for one. But if anybody out there knows of a good book uh, on OAuth, I would love to hear about it. Because that might help me out of this bind. But um, even if I could do this, I feel like um, 
<laughs> that makes me feel um, well. That's a fair point, right? I mean, the the ground keeps shifting on this, and I think that's also part of the problem is that you can find things that were written, you know, either blog posts or actually code libraries that were written two years ago, but they don't seem to line up with where the world is now. Um, but I feel like you're not supposed to have the access token in the browser. Like, even if I could make this work, I feel like you're not supposed to have the access token in the worker somehow. So I feel like, or in the browser somehow, <clears throat> because it can be easily extracted and that that would be bad. Um, although I'm not sure. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not entirely. Well, so that's that's the other pro po possibility is that all requests proxy through the worker. And I feel like that's probably what's actually supposed to happen is that everything's supposed to go through the worker. Um, and uh, but even if I do that and is it so I don't remember whether you actually did OAuth using the Cloudflare worker or not. Because if you did, you might be able to solve this problem. But I also got stuck because the browser makes the login request. The Cloudflare worker um, Oh yeah, so a, a totally different flow. And actually I've, CL, I've got some things to say about CLI in a hot second. Um, but um, uh, the browser makes the request. The browser then wants some kind of response back saying, hey, yes, you logged in, life is good. So that the browser knows to go to sort of an authenticated page. The problem is if we weren't, well, if we weren't using a Cloudflare worker, your server would receive the request. It would have a conversation with GitHub and when they get, that request was done, um, then that answer, then, then the server would be able to generate the appropriate request back to the client. The problem with workers, and this would apply, I think, to any of the serverless setups, is that when the browser makes the request to the server, the, the Cloudflare worker, the Cloudflare worker makes a request to GitHub. GitHub's going to make a post request back here. And the problem is that the post request back here might be picked up by a different worker because the whole point of Cloudflare workers, AWS Lambda, whatever, is that you might replicate instances to handle load you have no guarantee that it's the same worker that's going to process the post request from here that was the process that received the get request from here. And so they, those two instances are going to have to talk to each other through some sort of, in the case of Cloudflare, the KV store. Well, yeah, right. I mean, I think you could do that. But then the worker that receives the initial request basically fires off the thing and then has to sit around waiting for the KV store to update. And then when it does, then it can pass back its response. It all just seems really complicated. Um, and it would be a whole lot simpler if you had sort of just a regular server where the you would know you have one process and it would wait, you know, make the post request, wait for the, to GitHub, wait for the response, get the response, then send the response back to the browser, and you wouldn't need all this other faffing about. Um, so, uh, um, okay, so Kev, Kev Burns, I typically drop the access token into an HTTP only secure cookie, and the proxy request to so the worker remains stateless. Um, and the access token is encrypted in the browser. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I guess I don't, so 
are you actually using um, Cloudflare workers? And how do you deal with the um, the problem that I was just talking about where the requ request comes to one worker, which makes a post request here, that makes a, a request here, and then there's a post request coming back, which might go to a different server instance of the worker, sorry. Do you end up using KB Store to like handle that problem as well? Because um, I just I, I got really lost in this. Um, uh, and if you have an example of something like that that's out in public, that would be super cool. Um, uh, so I'm I'm so I'm stuck. It's a short version, um, and I don't want to. Um, have a bunch of people flailing or watching me flail. Um, I just don't think that's a smart way to use our time. If I can figure some stuff out between now and um, Saturday, right? We come back to it Saturday morning. Uh, but it just didn't seem to be smart today because I, I spent hours on this yesterday and, and I was just like, I, I had not felt quite so stupid about a programming problem in a long time, uh, which is, from a, from a faculty perspective, is very useful. Um, it's good to remember that we can feel really lost about these things, and um, uh, that what it's like for students to be um, quite befuddled as well. Um, so uh, it's frustrating, but it's probably useful in some sense. Um, I'm going to post. Th this is the Discord invite link. Um, if anybody's got suggestions um, uh, or would like to be part of discussion about this whole business on the Discord, that would be awesome. Um, uh, let me think. Am I, am I just remembering this wrong? I've read this a thousand times. You'd think I would know. Um, so... So you make a get request to GitHub, and that returns. No, see that doesn't return the code. Um, you get a. Oh no! Yes, no, you're right. It does return the code, and then you make the post request. So the same worker can make the post request to GitHub and wait for the response. And then it could send the access token back here. And then, as you said, uh, you could put that in an HTTP only secure cookie. And then it would be... Um, the worker would never be engaged again and everything else would happen just directly between the browser and the uh, GitHub API. Yeah, so why did I convince myself that that was not what was happening? I have no idea. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it feels like you're right. We ought to be able to do exactly that. So my diagram actually should work. So we make, so the worker gets a, some sort of login request. It makes this request to GitHub. That request returns a code in the uh, response. Um, and then... Oh, uh, the, oh, so actually this is part of the problem. Actually, the browser, I don't think the browser, well, at least using, I'm not sure we can have the browser make this one. Um, because... So what was the issue? 
So I, I had a whole lot of problems with um, right because this has to come up in the browser. Oh, okay. So th I think this was this was one of the problems that I ran into. If I um, let's see, do I have that? Uh, 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 uh. Uh, I don't seem to have that. So when you have uh, 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 GitHub, McVee, when you settings, developer, OAuth, ice repos, you have to specify a callback URL. Um, and that callback URL has to be your Cloudflare worker. Right? GitHub is going to call the Cloudflare worker to have this handshake exchange. But if the well i'm not entirely sure what the issue was but i was never able to get that to work with a cloudflare worker no matter what i put here and i put a lot of things here i always got a mismatch url error from github github would say hey the 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 URL you've asked me to talk to isn't the same as the URL you put here on the web page, and those have to match, or I'm not going to have this conversation. And what was really weird is that frequently these, I mean, these would be exactly the same. The error message includes the URL that it's using, and it matched exactly the URL here. So I totally don't understand how or why there could be a mismatch, I'm completely lost on that. Now, sometimes, depending on what I put here and how I was running the Cloudflare development environment, I would get mismatches that made sense in that GitHub was clearly trying to, when it was making this callback, it was clearly trying to use the cloudflare.dev URL, even though I'd never put that anywhere. Obviously something in the redirecting in the whole Cloudflare universe caused GitHub to think it was talking to a .dev URL instead of the local host URL that I was using. But I was able to start Wrangler dev in local mode and that actually got it to where it would appear to be a local host thing, but it always said that there was a mismatch. And I, again, I probably spent two, three hours flailing around about that. And I never have found anybody who has posted or talked at all about that as a problem. So I have no idea what's going on there. None whatsoever. Um, and so that's, I think, why I was thinking that if Cloudflare, oh, let's see, where am I? Um, no, not that. Um, oh, yeah, over here. That if we made a request to Cloudflare and Cloudflare then made the request to GitHub, um, so it could be a URL encoding, I guess. I don't, I, I, what would I even look, look for to understand that? Um, I, that, I, I'm not even sure how to begin to debug that. Um, uh, so, um, okay, so. So I guess then we have a question. And and I 
quite happy to leave it up to the um, folks that are here. Um, uh, is do we attempt to flail in this and see if we can figure something out? Or do we step aside and see if I can figure something out off on the side and then come back to this when I feel like I sort of am more on top of it? I have posted a question about this on the Cloudflare forum. Um, it currently is in uh, awaiting moderation because um, I had never interacted with that forum before. So I created a new account, promptly dropped a big question, and oddly enough, their bot was like, "I'm not sure we trust you. Um, we'll get, we'll have an admin look at this and get back to you." Um, so that all happened yesterday, and uh, at least as of an hour ago, I was still in admin limbo. Um, so I'm hoping maybe over in Cloudflare land, somebody will be like, whoa, I totally know how to do what you're talking about. And here's an example and go. And that would be awesome. But uh, yeah. Um, so my inclination is to work on something else this morning. Because I just don't feel like I would get anywhere today. But if you folks, because there's clearly people here with OAuth experience um, more than I have. Um, and uh, if you're like, no, let's do OAuth, let's do OAuth, let's do OAuth. I would be totally fine with doing OAuth. Um, uh, so I don't know, thoughts. And, and the alternative, just to be uh, clear um, is uh, I would I, I I think that what we do is we would actually do evolution, ev evolutionary computation. I can share the results from last week's timing studies, um, and we could start doing uh, evolution of whole computer programs, and just instead of just evolving bit strings and. Evolving programs is going to be a whole nother kettle of fish. And I think that it's going to evolve, involve a lot of, I think there's a lot of potential for rust weirdness. Um, because I think the way we have typically done this enclosure in the past has taken advantage pretty aggressively of the lack of any meaningful typing in Clojure, um, uh, which has provided a lot of really nice flexibility. Um, and I don't know quite how this best plays out in uh, Rust land. I think there's going to be maybe some dynamic types. I don't know. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. Um, but I think that that's going to be an interesting design, um, uh, design question. Um, so, so I guess my inclination is it to is to go to the evolution computation thing um, for you know the, the last hour and a half, and at least start start a conversation about what that might look like in Rust, um, and then we can um, you know if somebody maybe somebody on the, the the Cloudflare forum will jump in and save the day. Um, I'm not sure, but um, let's see what happens. Um, so uh, so if people are okay with it, I'm going to do evolution computation for a little bit so I don't feel like a complete idiot. Um, and then we'll uh, come back to OAuth later when uh, I, maybe I know what's going on a little more. So, um, so actually, a quick benchmarks. Um, so for those who weren't here last Wednesday, um, we finished a simple, well, we actually, a, two weeks ago, we finished a simple GA in Rust um, that evolved bit strings. Um, so fixed length vectors of Booleans um, in Rust land. And last week, we finished up a closure version to do more or less the same thing. Um, and I did some, uh, timing studies after the, uh, stream was over, which definitely needed to be after the stream was over because the closure 
Criterium runs took about four hours, so definitely would not have been fun to watch on the internet. Um, and uh, so we can get into the details if people care, but the short version is on uh, my old iMac, which is now like seven or eight years old. It's a pretty old box, um, which has got four cores, so eight threads, um, uh, a run uh, in Rust took about 1.9 seconds, and in Clojure took about 1.6 minutes. So it was about 50 times faster in Rust. Um, and then on a 40 thread, so uh, 20 core, uh, 40 thread server that we have in our lab, that's pretty old hardware. This is not, these are, you know, not sort of, it's not a, it's not, it was not purchased for its computational power. Um, uh, it's, it's really there to provide um, server support for things. Um, uh, it, uh, Rust took about 1.14 seconds. Closure took about 2.59 minutes. And this is interesting that when we had more threads to work with, Rust got faster. Closure actually got slower. Um, and I think, well, actually, I'm not entirely sure why, to be honest with you. Um, one thing I definitely noticed is that Rust had pretty much all of this cores pegged pretty much all of the time. Everything was running at about 100%. So BTOP was saying the total CPU load was like 98% typically. Whereas with Clojure, the total load tended to be between 70 and 80%. Um, all the cores were being used, but none of them were being used fully. And I don't completely know why that is. Um, I think part of it might be related to garbage collection, but there's more going on than that because, um, like I said, there's just a lot of cores weren't always busy. Um, so there's some kind of blocking or I don't really know. I don't know what what was different in the closure code that was causing it to scale up more less effectively. And we've seen this before. Um, I have a colleague who has sort of a, a big cluster of sort of high-end gear um, specifically for doing these kinds of runs on. And they, they paid a lot of money, and this is some years ago now, for a uh, thing with, I think, 80, 40 cores, 80 threads, I think is what it was. Um, and, um, oh, thank you, Kev Burns. That looks awesome. Um, I will definitely uh, have to have a look at that. Um, so Kev just shared in the Discord a link to a uh, GitHub gist on OAuth um, and that could be hopefully useful. So, um, uh, uh, so they had this high end thing, and we we found that running the closure evolution computation system on it didn't scale nearly as well as we had expected, um, and it was it's never been clear why. Um, but I'm seeing kind of the same thing here. Um, but interestingly, Rust does not seem to have that problem. That Rust, when we put it on a box with a whole bunch of cores, it uses all of them and goes um, and makes everything very hot and a, and a bunch of fans spin up um, to keep the world from melting. So any way you cut it, it's faster. Um, so Rust is, like I say here, about 50 times faster on this computer like 136 times faster on the 40 thread server. And this, these are like meaningful numbers. Um, and uh, people are regularly doing things that take days or weeks in closure at the moment um, that could then, you know, uh, something that takes two days would take about an hour in Rust. Um, and that makes, you know, that's, that makes a big difference um, if you're doing research or 
you're a student in a class or you're you know working on an engineering project um that's a, a big deal and of course 136 times faster we're looking at you know something that would take on the order of a week would happen in an hour um and so that's you know uh, a big deal so so i think these numbers are certainly enough to be worth pressing on with um uh and, and I think spending time trying to build a Rust system that evolves computer programs, which is what my research colleagues and I actually do, not bit strings, um, would seem to be an entirely reasonable thing. So that's that. Um, so, so then the question is, well, how are we going to actually do this? And there are, so this, this moves from genetic algorithms, which are typically fixed length bit strings that are being evolved to genetic programming, which is where you actually are evolving computer programs represented somehow. Um, the, the traditional approach, which dates back to the late eighties, early nineties, um, and was popularized by a guy named John Koza, um, is to use basically syntax trees. Um, so this should look pretty familiar. Um, but you've got operators as nodes and, you know, values, variables as leaves. Um, and you can do things like, uh, mutate, um, one tree to another tree. One program can mutate to another program by just generating a random tree and sticking it in some place in this tree. And you can also do kinds of crossover where you swap chunks of trees between two parents. And that's how probably still the majority of genetic programming is done. It's pretty easy to implement, especially in a Lisp-like language, which is where this started. It has some weird evolutionary properties, which we probably don't need to dwell on here, but I could bore you to death with if you care. Um, it's tricky to add types. Um, so uh, you, if you need sort of to be able to put a random tree in a random subtree in a random place, then it's important that the types all work out. Um, and uh, so people either work in sort of monotyped universes, like everything's a number, or you end up having to attach types to all the nodes and then you have to like modify all the like mutation and crossover operations to respect those types. It's doable, but it's kind of a pain. Um, also the error handling is, is fuzzy. Um, if you have a tree and you divide by zero, now here we're dividing by two, but imagine this was some expression um, instead of a constant and sometimes that expression evaluated to zero, what would you do here? How do you handle that? There's no good way to um, kind of locally deal with that problem. Um, and if you just say, oh, we'll blow up the whole world, then um, that actually can be problematic. Evolution tends to shy away from things that are fatal. And if you... If you take like a divide by zero or some other kind of runtime error as being a fatal mistake, then evolution tends to be like, whoa, over there, there are alligators and they bite me and I die. Um, and so it tends to avoid that space. And so one of the things you might get is evolution's like, okay, let's just not have any divides in our program because division sometimes kills us. And so we don't really like division. So even if division is really important for solving the problem, the cost of failure is high enough that it's like, well, I don't really want to deal with division. Um, and so that is complicated and, and it's hard. You couldn't really, it's not obvious how you would say, oh, this operation failed. Can we just skip this operation, but still do the rest of the tree? Because the rest of the tree depends on there being a value for this chunk here. And if there is no value, what do you do? How do you move forward? So that's been an issue. So an alternative representation is to use stacks instead of trees and have a computational model that's more like 
the programming language fourth if you are old enough or have been into the weird ends of the computing universe to know about that. Um, so fourth goes back to the 70s, the 80s. Um, I think the 70s. Um, and it's a stack-based language. Um, and the idea is that you have a, you've got basically a virtual machine that you're uh, evolve, evaluating these evolved programs on. And that uh, machine has got a collection of stacks on it. And you have instructions that act on values on that stack, on those stacks. It's not very hard to implement. We'll talk a little bit more about how this works in a second. I'll do an example. Has some nice evolutionary properties. Um, a colleague of mine who kind of invented this, Lee Spector, uh, calls it expressive. Um, uh, you can express a lot of things this way. Types become trivial because you just have a different stack for every type. Um, and so that part's really easy. And error handling is more flexible. And we'll talk about that um, in a second after we do an example. So, um, so here, for example, whoa, we've got an exec stack. That's going to have our instructions. The, it's, it's sort of where the, the code lives. An integer stack, a Boolean stack, and a string stack. And you could have many other stacks. Um, stacks of vectors, stacks of characters, stacks of all kinds of things. And you, the, the machine works by executing the top instruction on the exec stack. So here the top instruction is an integer mult. So we would multiply together the top two integers. And then, so we pop these two guys, multiply them together and push the result back on. So that consumes the integer mult instruction. And now we have 140 on the top. Boolean and will take these two and them together, replace them with false. You can also have um, lists of instructions. I, they would be vectors of instructions in Rust. Uh, and if you have something like that and it gets executed, you just put the things in that vector on the exec stack. So the, string, the sequence three string dupe just puts string dupe on the stack and then three on top of it. So then three, just if we have a constant, it just moves onto the appropriate stack. String dupe takes the top of the string stack and duplicates it. So we get two hellos. Integer add adds these two things together and we get a hundred, negative 137. Okay. So that's the, the, the short version of how this works. Does that make sense? Questions about that? And so, yes, I agree, Kev, that sequence diagrams probably are more effective at communicating OAuth than network diagrams. Because um, you're right, the order of requests is really important. And my diagram obscures that sequencing in a lot of circumstances. So that doesn't seem like a bad plan um, to think about it in terms of sequence diagrams. Yeah, no, I agree. That's probably true. So thank you. Um, uh, so if we come back to uh, OX, I guess just, uh, and I can copy all this and, oops, ah, let's come out of here. Copy all this and post this. I'll post all this in the uh, chat in case anybody is keen. Um, uh, and then you don't have to like try to chase links. Um, but if we come back to here, um, one of the, so the type handling is easy. The error handling is also pretty cool because if something bad happens, you can just ignore that instruction. So if we did a divide by zero, you could be like, fine. Let's just pretend that instruction didn't happen. Now, there are different ways that you could pretend it didn't happen. Like, do you consume the two numbers that you were dividing? Um, do you remove them from the stack and they're gone? Or do you leave them there and say, well, if we did this instruction, something bad would happen, so let's just not do this instruction um, uh, and not consume anything? 
uh, and we could, there are arguments about which of those is better. And I don't think there's any clarity on that. Um, uh, but it, you can, at least it's possible to skip an instruction and continue going. And so that makes the error handling a lot nicer. Um, another piece of that is, uh, in all of our examples, when we did something like integer mult, there were two things here to multiply, but there might not have been. Maybe this stack is empty. Maybe this stack only has one value on it. And then if we do integer mult and we don't find that we've got enough stuff, we just ignore the integer mult stuck instruction. We pop it off the stack and continue on as if it was never there. It becomes a no op. And those we've historically tended to leave the values behind. So that could be an argument for if you, if you would divide by zero, you should leave the values behind. Like I said, there's different conversations to be had there. Um, so this is what I want to implement in Rust. And this actually, there's some complications here, especially if it's going to be really general. Um, so, Certain things are pretty straightforward. I mean, the exec stack is probably, we'll probably need some notion of an instruction. And so everything on the exec stack will be a single instruction or a vector of instructions. So we probably have an enum there. Okay, that's fine. And what's an instruction? An instruction could be just a function that takes a state and returns a new state. And that's actually how it's implemented in Clojure. And a state is then sort of the wrapper around all of the stacks. Okay, that's a thing. Um, but the the th the place where I, I don't know how to... Um, oh, so um, that's a great question. Um, uh, you could totally do that, right? That This is... Um, so the suggestion is giving it two forms of division, one that consumes and one that doesn't and let evolution sort it out. And that actually would be an entirely reasonable approach. Um, uh, one question is, so th there are a couple of different ways that could be implemented. One would be you could, you know, get seriously interested in the which one works better part of your question uh, with the intention of maybe only having one of them available in the long run because you've done some sort of study that says, oh, this clearly works better than that. Now, that sort of study is a tricky thing to do. Um, it's hard to make really general statements because you're going to be basically doing experimental comparisons. And lots of people do this kind of stuff all the time. I have published papers doing this kind of thing. But you have to be a little careful about what how to about over-interpreting the results. So you could say, let's do runs with version A and runs with version B on a bunch of different test problems and see if there's a pattern that A is consistently better or worse than B. And if you get lucky and let's say B is consistently better, then you could be like, hey, we think there's evidence that you should use B instead of A. But again, that's on your test problems, blah, blah, blah. It can be affected by other choices you've made in the design of your system. Um, so it can be complicated to make too broad a statement about one being better than the other. Um, but, you know, like I said, people do this kind of thing all the time. Another option would be to just leave both of them in all the time and let evolution say, you know, give evolution all the toys and evolution can be like, hey, here I like this kind, but there I like that kind. And you could imagine programs that actually have both versions in different places. That in this part of this program, we're going to use this one. And in this part of this program, we'll use this other one. That would be entirely plausible to me if that happened. Um, the the So in some sense, my gut instinct would be to like give it all the stuff. The problem there is if you have too many things, um, uh, evolution can be a little overwhelmed if there's too much stuff um, to work with. Um, and uh, one thing you've done there is 
you probably only have one addition instruction because addition doesn't typically fail. Now we could get into, um, especially because we're in Rust, we could get into questions of, of overflow and we could have addition instru instructions that check for overflow and addition, addition instructions that don't. But in closure, because everything's a big int, um, people don't tend to bother. Um, and there's just one addition instruction, but there'd be two division instructions. Um, the one that checks for division by zero and the one that doesn't. Now that means that when you're generating random programs at the beginning, you're twice as likely to have a division instruction than an addition instruction. So that actually biases the world in favor of more division versus addition or multiplication or subtraction, since none of those are likely to have obvious error checking versions. Um, and that doesn't seem like that would be necessarily a big deal, but evolution's weird, actually. It's amazing how often little things can really send you into weird directions. Um, so that would be a potential concern about just throwing everything in is, do you have kind of a reasonably balanced collection of tools um, so that those initial randomly generated programs um, aren't bi overly biased in certain directions? So, so things like that can be more complicated than one might think they are. But I like the idea. I think it's a really good question. And, and I agree completely that it would be interesting. And I don't know that anybody's done this. Um, it would be interesting to look at, you know, if you had the one that consumes and the one that didn't consume, um, do those behave in different ways? And can you see at least on a set of test problems that yes, there's definitely a difference in how those behave. Or if you give it both, is there yet another kind of pattern of behavior? So I would love to do that experiment, but, um, we will not do that today. <laughs> um, so, so the, the thing, the thing where I get, I'm not sure how rust is, how things are going to work out in rust is arbitrary stacks and arbitrary instructions in closure. All of this is totally straightforward because there's basically no typing. So your state can have an arbitrary list of, um, uh, stacks. Those stacks can have types associated with them. Um, you can have instructions that then grab things from different stacks and act on them. Um, grab things by type name and act on them. Um, and closure doesn't really care what the type of those things are. So if you say, I want to grab something from the string stack, compute its length and add it to something from the integer stack, Closure's like, great, we can do that without having to worry about whether the thing on the string stack supports a notion of length and whether the, um, the result of that and the thing on the integer stack support a notion of addition. Um, we have no idea. It's just like, yeah, it's stuff. And so um, in closure, I mean, in Rust, uh, all of this is going to matter, right? We're, we're not going to be able to just um, uh, st mix things together and hope for the best at runtime. That's not a ru the Rust way. And so I'm not sure how we build a system, especially that is flexible for researchers moving forward. So we can put in the basic stacks. I don't think, and that's where I, where I figure we'll start. Um, and that I think should work fine. But then if somebody's like, oh, I want a stack of matrices or, oh, I want a stack of um, uh, bitmaps, um, images, a uh, stack of MP3 files, um, whatever, right? What is that going to look like? Um, and how, how can they add that and compile that into our system? Um, is this a, a trait thing? We just need to have the right traits and they can implement 
traits and then those will compile in I, i'm not sure this is there's i think some design questions here that are um, potentially complicated and that i don't have immediate clarity on so my inclination is to start with just like can we do some simple stuff um like can we start with just a um uh an integer stack and integer instructions to keep it super simple uh and get that to work and then start to build out um, and add some more stacks and see if we can see what the patterns are um, as we build the system out. I kind of feel like maybe in the long run, the goal is some kind of macro based domain specific language for defining instructions um, that we could, people wouldn't have to write their new instructions for their new stacks in Rust or at least it wouldn't look like Rust necessarily. They could write in some language that we invent that's sort of clearly stack-based and it gets through the macro system turned into Rust code because um, that might make it easier to sell this to people who don't want to learn Rust, um, of which I have some colleagues. <laughs> uh, but again, I think that's a, a tricky problem for you know later on. So, uh, wow, nearly 11. We've talked a lot. Let's see if we can write some code. So I'm thinking, let's see if we can just like have an integer stack and a um, the exec stack has just math and arithmetic instructions um, to keep things simple. And we'll see where we go from there uh, moving forward. So, um, and I think that's the end of those slides. Go away. There we go. So let's go to the code. Um, okay, so um, currently our individual type has a genome. So it's generic in T, where T is our genome type. And it has a total score and a vector of scores. Um, and... Um, Uh, one thing we're going to need to deal with, and that might be hinted at, uh, or a way around it <clears throat> might be hinted at here, um, I just sort of hacked in I-64s as the scores, um, but scores are actually probably a little more complicated than that. Um, so some systems, the scores would be floating point numbers, for example, and we don't support that. And at the moment, all the scoring in our system assumes bigger is better. And in fact, actually in this evolving program stuff, it's almost always the opposite. So you have a bunch of test cases that are like unit tests. Imagine having a bunch of unit tests for a program and, um, what you get is the error on that test and you want the error to be zero and higher errors are worse. So we're currently, we're trying to minimize the score in the um, uh, evolving programs universe. We're actually probably trying to, sorry, here we're trying to maximize the score in the um, evolving programs universe. We're probably trying to minimize the score. Um, so I think that this is gonna be an issue and a way to deal with it would be to have a different generic type S for the score. And if S also knew how to compare itself then that would be, we could just use that. And there is an org trait, partial org, org, and things like that. Um, uh, Rust um, org trait, is it org? I feel like, yeah, org. Um, so org takes, uh, has a, comp which takes two things and returns an ordering 
and an ordering, oh good, is less, equal, or greater. Cool. So we could say that a score is less, hmm, her. So the, the language is a little off here because you a score would be less in the same way that an error would be less, but we want an error to be less and we want a score to be more. Um, so this doesn't this doesn't include a preferred direction. So it's like we maybe need a different trait um, that is um, embeds the direction in it. Um, Or can we? No, I don't think we could do that. Yeah, because it's kind of like we'd want ordering, but instead of less, equal, greater, we'd want like better, equal, worse um, uh, as our possible values. Um, and uh, that's going to require a different trait here as well. But I think that's all doable. Um, and the trick is, can we use ORD as well? Or do we just make our own thing? Because um, like ORD's not all the heavy lifting. And really all we want to do, it's, it's almost like what we want is a, a from implementation that takes us from ordering to some other type. Um, and that in some instances, uh, that's going to want to be, uh, yeah, but you can't have multiple from implementations in the same system. Um, you have to pick one. Hmm. I don't know. Not sure the best way to do that. This is a place where uh, my rust is rusty. Well, rusty is wrong because it implies it was good and it's gotten worse. It's just my rust is incomplete. So if we did this, we would want something like. Actually, do I have a new? I do have a new thread, a new branch, right? Uh, no, I don't. I should have a branch. Um, uh, oh, let's actually talk about genericize. Genericize um, scores. Um, oh, so hi, Wagafa. Um, you can have more than one from implementation, but... So let me be, try to be clear about what I was saying. You can't... So let's imagine... Let's come back to uh, here. So let's imagine I have a from implementation that takes an ordering to... Um, I don't know, I call it, I'll call it preference for now. Um, uh, so better, equal, worse. I could only have one mapping from ordering to preference. I can't have one mapping that goes from ordering to preference in this direction, and then in the same program have a different mapping that would reverse the direction. Um, so if some of my uh, tests, I want to think of big as good and small as bad, that would be one ordering. And if in other tests, I reverse that, 
big is bad, small is good. I want a different uh, preference mapping. I presumably can't have two different preferences. Um, uh, interesting. Let me go. Um, oh, let's see. I'm going to need here. Burr, burr, burr. Nice repos. Code up. Um, oh, over here, buddy. So uh, let's make this so you can read it. Uh, so you think that we have something I'm trying to remember the thing that you're talking about um not gonna be those that's coming and out that's regular from those are regular from is it this guy no here's we're implementing oh that's some error mapping that's more callback stuff yeah i don't remember um oh actually you said from underscore ah right ah that i think this is what you're thinking of because we had um two di yes right we had two different ways that we wanted to be able to com think of a boolean um and that if that boolean was coming from one part of the universe we wanted to interpret a false as keep and if it came from a different part of the universe we wanted to interpret a false as kept in review so we could do something like that um, and have so we could have a mapping from to go back to here um, an ordering to a preference and we could have multiple from methods that do that mapping uh, that's an interesting possibility um, so then so we would want um, if we want another thing here, we would want S and I, all this pr probably needs to be somewhere else. We have something like a trait. Um, actually it's a pub, right? So we have pub preference, um, better equal worse. Um, oh, enum. What am I doing? Pub. Oh, pu I it probably doesn't need to be pub, but I need the enum part. Um, and then we could have function. So, th uh, ooh. But we're going to want the numbers. So the error. We want to know how bad it is. I mean, I don't, maybe this better equal worse is not actually useful because we do really want the number and we could put a number here, right? Or we could, um, uh, uh, genericize that, um, with something as long as it's, um, implements number kind of things but is that really what I want to do here um, oh and actually uh, 
but no, this isn't right anyway, because this is, this is the, this is the result of comparing two things. What's in the individual is going to be the value itself. And we need to somehow turn that value into a, we take two values and compare them. So in the same way that ORD takes two values and returns an ordering, we want something that takes two or values and returns a preference. And those values are just going to be, so maybe I'm overcomplicating it. Maybe, maybe what I want is I want numbers and then another field of this struct is just how to think about those numbers um, so that we're okay having numbers for scores but an individual also has some kind of, I guess it would be an impl um, that tells it how to compare scores. Um, so we'd have some, uh, trait that says here's how you compare scores which sounds just like ORD so uh, good question because that might help clarify our, my thinking um, so basically the the um, the comparisons happen in the um, selection. So, for example, here we compute the best, uh, we get the individual with the best score. This is poorly named because um, it sounds like it's returning a score, but it actually returns an individual. So, it um, iterates over all the individuals uses max by key, and the key is it just gets the total score out. So this is going to return the individual in the population with the largest total score. And the problem is best isn't always largest. Best could be smallest in another context. Um, so... Um, Can you abstract out the score total to have different impulses with different orderings? Ah. So you're thinking that instead of having these in this struct, that we would have traits that an individual could impel that would... Um, well, so the second one, probably not for reasons which are complicated, but, but um, I can explain. Um, the first one sounds more promising to me. The second one is problematic because here, for example, where we have the, um, the score vector, um, this... I've been talking as if all the scores will always point in the same direction. Either up will be good or down will be good. But you could actually imagine a universe where you have different scores and sometimes for this score up is good, but for this other test down is good. So you could have sort of a whole combination of weird uppity downity things. Um, and so um, I think that that is where we get into trouble with the second option is that it'd be nice to be able to have like 
a, like a really flexible universe where you can have some scores where up is good and some scores where down is good and that the user can assemble those however they see fit and as is appropriate for their problem. Um, yeah, so that comment is what makes me think, you know, that this is the, that somehow S, but, um, you know, I feel like, uh, programming is hard. Thinking is hard. And it's a gray, rainy day. And so who wants to think on a gray, rainy day? Um, so the question is, what is S going to be? Like a simple thing would just be to do this. And then um, S becomes a generic type. Um, but we presumably want S to have to have some kind of property. Like we could say S, what's the syntax? Impl ord? No. S colon ord? Okay. So we could say S has to implement the ord trait. And that's actually pretty reasonable. Um, and so given two S's, we ought to be able to decide if one is um, what the order of. Um... Yeah, so that's actually 100% true. There are things that only care about the total. And there are things that um, care about the vector. So, so you could... Um, uh, you could say, for example, that you could say score of type S and S is a struct that has whatever scoring information you want it to have. Um, oh, maybe that's the way to think about it because then that's the thing that would implement ORD so or implements our sort of fancy trait um, uh, and what presumably there's a partial ORD yes there is what does partial ORD do it partial ORD gives us a an option ordering oh that's interesting that's how they deal with that okay so the ordering is still the same old thing but we put an option around it as a way of saying it doesn't have to actually work. And we'll just return the none variant if it doesn't do a thing. So we could say S should do partial ORD. Um, and so given two S's, we can try to compare them, but we aren't guaranteed that we'll get um, a... Uh, oh, and then, so instead of doing this here, you would say, sort of have some impulse so we could have, uh, Do I? So let's let's just like go with the simplest version of the world. Let's imagine we don't have vectors. All we have is a single numeric value, an i sixty four. Um, so I could imagine then. Uh, you know, impling something blah for individual bit string comma i64 so i could implement stuff 
um, for an i64. Why is it grumpy about that? Oh, because I didn't define a trait. So I'd have trait, blah. Um, and so blah needs. Uh, so this is where we would, we could. Um, so actually this could be. Um, actually we could just implement straight up ORD for that. Um, and then that will f not fail. Um, we need to have a comp. And then everything else will help happen for free. Um, So something like that, oh, yeah, we'd have to implement or uh, import that. So we would be saying that if the individual has just this as its score, then we can implement a straight up org for it because we can always compare them. Um, and if we wanted to create traits, ah, yeah, 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 right. So if we said S is ORD, then this just becomes um, some, uh, let's see, self dot score dot CMP other dot score, I think. I uh, didn't like that. Uh, oh, it's S impl or right? When it's in a, no, no. Uh, so it's S colon, but then it didn't like it. Why are you unhappy? Associated type bindings are not allowed here. Oh, I need to have an impl. I need to say S up here. Yeah. Um, but that still isn't happy. Um, associate type bindings are not allowed here. Uh, oh, so I've, I've got an issue here that this is not taking to, um, uh, S or T and replace bit string. Oh yeah, so T makes more sense than bit string because we really just care. Um, and then, well, Gaffa, you said switch the S's. I don't I mean, so this is going to need um, No, I'm, I'm clearly not. So, okay, this needs to go back to being this, I think. Oh, but the T, now T needs to be here. And this needs to be TS to get this to even compile. Actually, if I just, for a hot second, remove all of this nonsense, um, so we're focused on uh, just this piece of it. Impl T S colon ORD. Oh, 
I had it in the wrong place. And that's got to be a big ass. Okay. Whew. Thank you. Get there eventually. I expected. Oh, so that's. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So that would give us ORD. So that's actually nice. So that says for any individual with a fully ordered score type, we have individuals as fully ordered things. Okay. And then we could do something similar in pull T S partial ord um, partial ord for individual T S come self other self uh, option ordering self dot uh, dot score dot some other dot score so that would oh didn't like that oh it's probably not it's probably partial or something dot partial cmp yeah other dot score boom and we'll need the ampersand yeah. no why are you being grumpy cmp is not a member oh it's we're implementing partial cmp yeah okay so that gives us if we have um a full order or a partial order, then that propagates to individual through the score. That's kind of cool. I think that's a step in a direction. Um, now, if this assumes... Uh, This again assumes, well, it assumes a particular direction that big um, is, if we're using, for example, max over here, uh, max by key, this assumes big is better. Um, And so S can be a different struct for each direction. Yeah, so S here is just anything. And so I could make um, uh, this is a, ter a terrible name. We'll have to come up with a better one. Big is better I sixty four, um, and it's going to be an S, and it's going to implement. So it'll have some internal score. So pub um, score. Well, actually, what if we just call this a score? So. And we'll assume that score is generally bigger is better. And so impl um, ord for score. And that's going to look like this. And we will just say, um, in fact, Oh, we can even just derive. 
in this case, right? Um, I think we could just derive ORD. Except for it's not happy. Um, missing struct. Oh, I didn't have the word struct. Duh. So that, I think, would just give us the, the thing we were expecting. And then pub struct error. So that we would expect to go down. Here we'd impl um, board for error. Uh, and we just need to like flip the comparison. Uh, so that needs to be error, and this needs to be error, and we could, um, we could just do some negations, or we could flip the order. Oh, maybe we just flip the order. Well, maybe that's the easiest thing to do, is other dot error dot comp self dot error and that oh so maybe this didn't need this we'll take care of it yeah okay so that actually aha so then we could use score and score implicitly goes bigger is better. And error implicitly follows a smaller is better model and then you could have um oh is there a reverse order method on ordering yeah no we're gonna have to figure out the i64 vec thing so there's a reverse or i was wondering if there was a reverse if there was then that was going to be better um huh? what is that is that a helper struct for reversing ordering. Oh, okay. Um, so, is that the thing you're talking about? Um, Uh, so you think it's because I guess the question is would would including reverse like the word reverse somewhere make it clearer that what's going on like this this looks it would be easy to not read this and you know get that this is doing what this is actually doing um, so, I mean, I kind of like the idea of doing reverse, um, rust reverse board, um, check, oh, put a dot reverse at the end. I get it. Okay. So put this back the way that it had been self dot error, other dot error dot reverse. Ah, look at that. It even auto-completed. You're so smart at this, too. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. So now we've got the, the VEX64. And then I guess the question is, is that going to need to be... Can Do we need a new thing? Well, yeah, we are going to need a new thing here because we want both total error and the vector. 
So we're going to want some notion of uh, struct um, uh, vector. Uh, um, I thank you for checking the docs. That's one advantage of multiple people. Is you know we can all search the internet in parallel. Um, I think this is a mistake that faculty sometimes make who are really like anti computers in the classroom or anti phones in the classroom is that sometimes students actually can find useful stuff. Um, sometimes they can just be searching, you know, wandering around on Facebook and, and that's not helpful, but, um, sometimes students can like find useful things. Um, and that's pretty cool. Um, so I don't know what, so a good name here would be because we want a vector of and we don't really want a vector of scores yes yeah, sometimes they could be watching twitch streams i'm not sure that's ever happened in the world but i it could um uh and, and i guess you'd have to hope that um the audio wasn't that important or that the instructor didn't notice she had an earpiece in so a vector of um, because we could say a vector of score, right? But then we'd also then need a vector of errors. And do I want to have to have both of those separately? Um, well, let's just do that quick because we know we can, um, Ah, and pub vac i scores is vac i sixty four. So we could do something like that, and then we can. Hmm. If we're really just doing ordering, um. Oh, so, so you're thinking an enum vector, I don't know what a name is, I'm going to call it things for now, we'll fix that, and we're going to have, um, but I don't want to have, uh, I mean, I could have scores, but then I'm going to have to have a struct that has the two things in it. I don't think that's going to be. I, I don't think that's going. So, why are you yelling at me? Oh, that's not a struct anymore. Okay. So, uh, vector errors pub total error. Um, oh, and I guess I don't really want I-64 here. I want S that implements score. Oh, and I think it goes out here, doesn't it? S of t that implements score. S, S. Comment you out for a second. Not in a struct. Oh, in a struct, it does go over here. Uh, no. Uh, and it's. Oh, it's a struct, actually. I yeah, it doesn't. It needs to impl. Oh, right. So I don't really have a. Um, I'd end up with something like ORD here. Um, yeah, because I really want a trait. Um, but maybe, I don't know, maybe not. Maybe I just care about...
Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I didn't. I didn't put arbitraries in here. I just did. And if I did, then I would have just ended up pushing the the lump another layer down the rug. So yeah, maybe I just want I sixty four here for now. Not 46. Okay, so that makes a thing. And then, but then I end up with this. And I think this is what you're saying. I ought to be able to do something enemy about. Um, but those are actually identical, right? It's just in the. Since there's nothing that says that yeah so it's really it would just be the impl um that would well i guess but these are identical except for the impl as well um so maybe that's the thing impl or for vector scores um, com self other self self uh, dot. I guess we would just do this. And then error would be the same basic idea, but we reverse it. Um, dot reverse. Why are we? Uh, oh, capital S, capital S, capital S, capital S. Um, With score and error, if you made them a single enum, you could have both types in the same algorithm. So if you're, I think I, I need to get my head around what you're suggesting with an enum. So are you saying, uh, so I may, I think I may want that. I, so I think I do want to understand what you're saying, but I'm not sure I, I get it right now. So your are you, is this something like, um, and then pub direction uh, preference. Uh, and then we get rid of these pieces. I think that those are not helpful. Um, no, that, that, no, that can't be right. It would have to be something like, um, uh, uh, higher is better. It's terrible naming. Have to do improve on this, but lower is better. So you'd have a value and a direction that's attached to that value. Is that is that what you're thinking of when you talk about making a single enum? And then score would be higher is better is the preference and error is lower is better is the preference. And then we would just implement um, ORD on VAL and then we get one version of everything. Um, oh, 
Oh. So the other option would be pub enum val2. Oops. Ah. Um, score i64 or error i64. Ah. And that's probably, that looks more rusty um, than my version with the separate enum and the struct. Um, or wrap the existing score and error structs. Oh, yeah, so this could be score, and this could be error. And the value of wrapping the existing structs would be I'm not sure I see what the value of keeping the existing structs over just having um, I-64s there because we'd still end up just implementing ORD for VAL2 and we'd have PUB uh, oh no, no, FN some self other self ordering So self is going to be a val2. Oh, so I guess either way we're going to need some sort of uh, Oh. Sure, sure that makes sense. So you could have an impl that only takes one or the other whereas if we keep i64s here we can't like separate the two of them out and that okay that makes a lot of sense um and then Here, do I have to have a some sort of test, a match? Um, oh, and actually, but there's a, there's a complication here because. If one of them is a score and one of them is an error, so self is a score and other is an error, then I have to figure out what that means. What does it mean to compare uh, a score to an error? And it probably is an error, a bad thing. So that so really, I can only implement a partial ord for val two, I think. Because I think that um, oh, it's partial ord. Um, hello, why are you fussing? Why are you fussing? Partial order, I have to, oh, well, well. So partial order, order does weird things. Um, 
Let me go there. So I have to say, oh, so I have to say what the type of the right hand side is. Can I do that with ORD? No, ORD's got to take anything. Uh, oh, oh, it's option ordering. Is that my problem fundamentally? Uh, yes, right. This would be option ordering. And I just had ordering there and I replaced it with partial ordering. Yes, you're right. You're right. You're right. Thank you. Um, yes, keep reading. Always good. Uh, well, almost always good advice. So, so here I would have to say something like, if they're both scores, do one thing. If they're both errors, do another thing. Otherwise, return none, I think, would be the right thing to do. So I would have something like match. Uh, and I can match on both. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good I like that um, uh, so some no uh, score at, um, uh, self oh, I would need friends uh, score other and I guess we might as well um ooh, that's gonna look kind of weird um and score score no 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 that's not right be score score curly brace self and then score, score, curly brace, other. go away da -la -la, da -la 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 -la. so val self is a val 2 which either a score or an error Can I just say score? Ah, and actually, yeah, self score. And it, oh, I can't be using self here, can I? Self. Uh, something like that. No. Oh, it thinks that's a struct. Blur. Score. Oh, I need, yeah, right. Something like that would work. And then I'm going to want the same kind of thing with error. Self error. 
and error and and error and error. Oh, this needs to be error. Oh, and actually using the word error here is potentially a problem because that's widely used in Rust for other things. Um, so that may not be great, but uh, yeah. So you don't think this is necessary to implement partial or or the I, like I've got too much going on here. I'm not sure. Um, so then I'm thinking that this would then we would compare um, Oh, we could have just compared the scores so I didn't have to deconstruct them because we have ORD defined on the scores. Uh, so I didn't need to take these apart. So I could have just called this self score and other score and have a lot less noise. And then I could say self score dot sump other score. And that could be the return or not. Uh, oh, because it's going to have to be an okay. No, it's a sum. And it needs a close print at the end. Aha. Yeah. And then again, all of this could just be self error. And all of this is other error. And then bum, bum. some self error dot some other error. And otherwise we'll return none. Interesting. Okay. Um, hmm. Well, that's been exciting. And so that's another reason to have kept these as not I-64s, is then we can have these impuls down here and then use those impuls up here to compare scores and errors. Um, now, this is a terrible name. So that's going to have to get changed. Um, uh, what do I want as a name there? Um, so it's a score or error, which is a terrible name. Um, It's a value that comes from applying a test maybe a test result test value test result value um, I kind of like result, maybe. So a test result is either a score or an error. Ooh, and then, uh, right, I didn't change that here. Test result is a score or an error. And a test result implements partial org and a score 
implements ORD and error implements ORD. Um, ORD implements error, um, error implements ORD. Uh, so we still have to think about this. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe that's okay. Um, oh, the, although we probably would want to bring in our score error stuff here. So uh, this is really going to be um, hmm. So really, this is going to be a test result. Test results, plural. That's probably a bad choice. Uh, it's going to be a test result, and this will be a vector of test result. Now that requires that test result can be added up. So we're going to want to need to implement some kind of addition-y thing on test results for this to make sense, for this to make sense. Um, ah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe this really just wants to be something that implements ORD. And then we can use, um, or partial ORD. Potentially, I mean, I, we're not likely, so there's what happens and what could happen aren't always the same thing. In the work that I'm connected with the most, no. Uh, they're almost always the same thing. Actually, they... Is that true? Yeah, I'll say they're almost always the same thing. So it would almost always be a vector of scores or a vector of errors. And it's actually almost always a vector of errors because we've got these unit tests and zero is you passed, you have no error, and a higher number is like you were, you know, the, the expected answer was five, you returned seven, so your error was two. Um, kind of thing. But they could vary. You could have situations where some things are scores and some things are vectors. Um, and uh, it would be, in a perfect world, nice to be able to keep them separate. Um, on the other hand, I don't want this to become a blocking issue um, that prevents us from making progress on the larger problem. Um, because it is fairly rare that you mix them and in a pinch you always just can negate the values and then an error becomes a score and a score becomes an error. Um, and, and so people hack that a lot. They just assume that, you know, less is good and, and negate something if they need it to be the other way around. So there's sort of, we don't want to spend an infinite amount of time on this. Um, but I think this has been um, really interesting. Um, and I kind of feel like, I mean, because we're, it's 12, so I should wrap up here. I've got to go vote, among other things. Um, today in the United States, we're, we're electicating. Um, so I've got to go make sure I uh, participate in democracy um, and do my voting thing. Um I don't know, I do sort of feel like maybe this ought to be a parameterized type. Um, oh, but, e well, but even that, I guess if these are going to vary, they'd have to be a vector of things that implement something, but that can't be, you can't have vectors. Um, do that. 
uh, I mean, I guess they could hold, they can hold test results, and that's a way for them to hold both. Um, so maybe back up to this. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to let it go for now. Um, we will pick this up tomorrow night, 7 to 9. Um, uh, so there'll be Wednesday, 7 to 9, more evolutionary computation. Um, uh, then Saturday morning, uh, 10 to noon. Don't know whether that's going to be um, ice repos or more EC. Um, depends really on whether I can make some sense of how to do the um, the Cloudflare thing. And I got some good suggestions here, so I'm hopeful maybe I can make some progress between now and Saturday and feel like it would be worth spending time on that. And then Saturday, uh, 2 to 4, it's not entirely clear what I want to do there. Um, I think I might uh, do one more session on um, the segmented file system. Uh, to improve the error handling. Right now there's a ton of um, uh, question marks and uh, dot unwrap and dot expects that are probably not awesome. And so I think that maybe one more session to clean up the um, error handling on that wouldn't be a bad thing. And then... I think I would probably declare that done. Um, and then we see where we go from there. So um, so I think that's all super good. Thank you all for your help and advice. I will commit this non-functioning code because um, uh, all the individual stuff needs to. So the fact that individuals depend on um, a uh, score thing is going to have to be sorted out but actually we've got to figure this out first i guess um and then that'll propagate through a whole bunch of code i presume because i think the i64 assumption is is cooked in lots of places so we'll have to see how far that actually it'll be interesting to see how far that spreads um once to sort of understand what the model wants to be so thank you all you're awesome human beings and I will see everybody on tomorrow night, on Wednesday, tomorrow night. And uh, we'll do more of this and hopefully get someplace useful. So, ciao!